I would like to welcome uh, Eric Thompson, the speaker for this evening. Uh, Eric Thompson has been a quality engineer for the last 15 years. Uh, he has been working with organizations of all sorts of uh, sizes, uh, leading teams uh, of engineers with varying degrees of expertise and backgrounds. Uh, let me welcome uh, Eric. Thanks, Shay. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you still a decent sized group hanging around, end of a decently long day. Uh, so like Jay said, I'm uh, Eric Thompson. I uh, work at Puppet Labs, or what used to be called Puppet Labs. It's Puppet Incorporated now in Portland here. Um, I'm not Tony Robbins, but I'll try to keep you awake, and I won't even make you walk over hot coals, I don't think. Um, so just getting started, uh, if I could see, just bear with me for a second, if I could see a show of hands, who's had trouble motivating themselves at work? That's it? And who's had trouble motivating other people at work? Yeah, so we all kind of understand the problem. Uh, three tenets, what the hell's a tenet? It's not these guys, these are the three tenors. Um, most people think of a tenet as a principle or belief, and I usually associate a tenet with um, something that supports that principle or belief. Um, and um, sometimes they're associated with philosophy, and we're talking about philosophies around how to motivate people or how to get them to motivate themselves. Um, I think we all understand that problem like we indicated. The, I kind of think of them as like three-legged stools. If you are missing any one or one facet of one of the legs, the stool doesn't work so hot. Um, so these three tenets, three tenets can be used to support or prop up the motivation of your team and the motivation of yourself to motivate your team um, every day. Um, so previously and historically, um, some would say archaically, we kind of had this carrot and stick model. Um, there's a psychologist from the 40s, Abraham Maslow, that uh, theorized that we are motivated by our, our intrinsic um, needs and our extrinsic needs. Um, a lot of people have heard about this, um, but the five needs that he broke them up into are basically divided into physiological, safety, social, esteem, and self-actualization. And the carrot and stick really, if you think about it, it really only addresses the first two, right? Like we have physiological, so like food and shelter, um, and safety would be the one that's kind of addressed by the stick here. Uh, it, the, stick, the stick is actually represented by the devil on this horse. Uh, so we don't want to be punished. Um, and we need our basic needs met, but we also need this, this social need that humans seem to have, um, as well as our own self-esteem and understanding our self-actualization and how that applies to the things that we do every day in order to really drive us. Um, the very basic extrinsic needs, I think most people would agree, is kind of like the setting in which um, you need to live in order to, for the other three to even really matter all that much. Most people would uh, feed themselves before um, building their social network, for instance. Um, but by not addressing all these needs, we're really leaving a bunch of opportunity on the table, um, and therefore the productivity of our teams on the table. Why doesn't this work? Hmm. So a lot of people think that everybody's unhappy at work. Um, I think these days we're starting to understand that you don't have to be unhappy at work. And um, this is basically where I tell a little story about my history. I, the first engineering job that I had, I worked at a Fortune 500 company with a three letter name. <laughs> and I was pretty unhappy. I was an intern for a summer and uh, wasn't exactly their fault. But I worked in the executive group uh, as a technical intern and they 
the only deliverable that I had was basically a spell check dictionary with the acronyms of the company so the executives didn't have to waste their time uh, you know, correcting the words for them. So like any good like nerd in training did, I basically automated away this process so I could gather the terms really quickly and then um, install the dictionary on all the executives' machines in an automated fashion. And basically what I'm getting at here is that it was super boring. The deliverable was super open-ended, but at the same time not in itself very motivating. And I've just figured out a way to motivate myself. And I think I stumbled upon these three tenets without understanding them. And um, I look back on it uh, with pride because uh, everybody thought that I was very successful. I also made myself busy for an entire six months instead of like a week gathering stupid terms. Um, but basically, I found my own solution. And some people term that as a, like autonomy, a way of finding your own solution. Um, I had to work with new tools. This is actually OSX Warp. If anybody remembers that operating system from IBM, it's like, uh, or it was, uh, Windows 95 competitor. Um, and these new tools allowed me to learn new skills um, in a new system that I didn't understand before that. And people look at that or term it as mastery. And the third tenet, um, purpose, for me at the time was just learning new things. But um, we'll get more into that. In, in the coming slides. So I already kind of blew the punchline on the three tenets. Um, Dan Pink wrote this book called Drive. Anybody read Dan Pink's book? Yeah, okay, so some of you know it. Um, and I talk a little bit about, or a lot about those three tenets in the slides. There's also other people that have kind of come across the three tenets uh, without directly addressing them in their studies and their work. Tony Say from Zappos is one of them. Um, but the first tenet that uh, Dan Pink talks about is autonomy. And <clears throat> I talked about that as um, basically a way of like, coming upon your own solution. Um, but this is someone's basic determination over aspects of their work in life, uh, such that they can control their own destiny. Um, and this kind of requires an environment in which you can make mistakes. Right? You need to, in order to be feel free to come up with your own solutions. It's good if you can uh, know that you can try things in a safe environment, make mistakes, learn from them, um, and move on. So those types of challenges and um, failures should really be encouraged by anybody that can. I actually interviewed a candidate once. And they said, uh, <laughs> wait, you mean I can write, write tests in any programming language that I want? Where do I sign up? That was like all they needed to be sold by that company. Um, special circumstances, um, any programming language is one of those things that a lot of us is a holy grail. Um, but it was good enough for them, just the autonomy portion. The second one, uh, Dan Pink terms mastery. And this is uh, kind of a basic gaming tenet. We've seen a lot of gamifications in websites and all sorts of other things. We've been talking in this room, this track today, a lot about metrics. And we've seen how metrics can be used badly, but in some cases, it's just a way of people tracking their progress um, and giving them a sense of positive momentum, positive movement. Um, people talk about um, improvement and constant improvement. This is one way of looking at it. Um, this, in a lot of cases, requires an environment where you have fast feedback loops so you can understand what your learning is, what your, how you are leveling up, how you are mastering something. Um, and that feedback might come in all sorts of different ways while you're on the job. So any type of problem solving or puzzle can be important for people to understand their forward progress. Um, one way of people looking at these challenges is Goldilocks. You know, just not too much, just not too little. So if you have a challenge that gets too easy, maybe somebody's gotten too good at it, people tend to get bored. Um, but if it's too hard, conversely, then people hesitate. They don't want to tackle it because they think they're going to fail. So not only fostering that environment where they can fail, um, but providing tasks <coughs> and challenges that are just right, Goldilocks level, 
uh, to make people want to like tackle them one at a time and see their progress. Um, one way we do this at work, or one, one thing that works for me, is just learning new software. So it's fun for some people to learn new tools. Um, somebody at work recently was talking about uh, tricking the elevator to close the door to, to close the door faster. But it turns out that the closed door button doesn't really do anything on most elevators anyway. So. <laughs> I also had uh, somebody recently, <laughs> I was doing something and struggling, you know, when people are watching you try to drive a computer and you make all sorts of silly mistakes. And they said, why don't you use this other editor? It's so much better than Emacs. So yeah, some of you get that joke. It's that kind of show-offness, like, like, look, I'm good at this. It's another way of them exposing their mastery. I evidently have to use, learn how to use Google Slides. Um, the third tenet that Dan Pink talks about is purpose. Um, and this one can be really difficult. It's both difficult to define for most people, um, but also difficult to uh, produce and work from day to day. So not, not all of us have a job that's, we're not all saving lives all the time. Um, and this can be different for everybody, but it's basically a benefit that's larger than yourself. Um, and this connects the work that we do to people and our own values, but hopefully the values of the company as well. Um, so it's things like, you know, how, how does the software that maybe you're testing or that you're like leading a team to develop, how, do, how does that software help others? Um, and if that doesn't really work very well, maybe it's, I don't know, software to like sell things that nobody wants or something and you're stuck there. Um, how does your work help your coworkers? That, that's a big thing for people is teamwork um, and helping other people. Um, maybe it's uh, gaming the elevator at work so you can get home to to, to, to your kids easier. Uh, and some people say I look like Kevin Spacey. Mm -hmm. So first things first, compensation matters. I, we talked about the extra, extrinsic motiva motivators. If we're not paying our employees properly and, and competitively, these other things really don't matter. It, it's kind of like the baseline uh, floor that everything else is based is you're standing on um, and you know you can say if you're not paid well just find another job that can be really difficult for some people maybe there's not a really competitive market in your region um, maybe you're strapped for bills and your family's counting on you you can't just like go and spend time to look for another job maybe you can find the three tenets and the things that you do every day you know you're stuck in a dead-end job maybe you can make it exciting for a little while um, but, like I said, I think for most people, if you're not paid well, if you're not making ends meet, it's really difficult to find purpose uh, in your day-to-day -day nonsense. Uh, so Tony Say from Zappos wrote a book called Delivering Happiness, and he actually talks about four uh, key factors to uh, what he calls delivering happiness, which is basically like encouraging his employees and how to create happy employees. Um, and he postulates amongst other people that happier people deliver better things um, and are more sustainable in their jobs, there's less turnover. Um, and the four that he talks about is sense of control, and that's kind of can be viewed as autonomy, uh, control over your work, destiny, impact on the product that you're delivering. Uh, perceived progress, and that for me is very much mastery, um, gamifications, um, and really tracking and measuring people's success over time. Uh, vision and meaning is the third that he talks about, and that's pretty clearly purpose from my point of view. Understanding your goals um, and people's understanding of their connection to those goals. And a lot of people have been talking about that in this room today as well. Um, when you talk about goals of your team and corporate, corporate goals, corporate values, forming those as a team so people have input into them and they feel like their voice is being heard, super important so they can feel how they connect to those goals exactly. Uh, but the fourth one that he talks about is connectedness. And this is something that's um, a little bit different, um, 
but I kind of view it as the overall team and how you connect your work uh, and your impact to the greater team and those people around you socially. And that's kind of the thing that I lump under purpose in the Dan Pink model. Um, so for many, uh, just doing something for your team to like make other people's lives easier, their coworkers around them that they see every day, that's, that can be good enough. We're very social animals, so people will do things uh, out of the goodness of their heart. Um, this also has a big impact on uh, mobile workforce. We have companies that largely are, are increasing the amount of remote employees that they have or people that are traveling. Um, you need to attract good talent and maybe they're not in Portland, maybe they're not in your city, or they are in Portland and you're somewhere else. Um, creating this connectedness uh, and purpose can be really difficult for those people. So um, creating a sense of inclusion and dedication incentives can be really important. Bring them in more often, do team building, especially with remote employees. We have a uh, Halloween costume uh, contest coming up at Puppet. And uh, the remote employees are all gonna send in their stuff to make sure that um, if they wanna be included, that they can be included. And that's really important to make that connectedness seem, seem and feel real to all the employees. So I, I get this a lot. Who, who cares if your people are happy? It's a workplace, it's not daycare, it's not, you know, do you want to work or play? I, I've heard that a few times. One time I was negotiating for vacation when I went to get a job. This is a while back. And, and I actually heard somebody say this to me, like, do you want to work or play? And most people would say, why not both? You know, uh, rest and play are things that can be really important for people, not only for being productive when they're not playing, but if work is play, then people are just going to do it for the fun of it. So it'll feel autonomous. Mastery comes from the repetition with which we all yearn to play like real child we are children, I think. And um, for some people, if you're having fun at work, that's enough purpose just to do the thing. Uh, Rosabeth Cantor wrote in the Harvard Business Review, she had this article about uh, people tackling challenges. And just like Tony say, she said that the happiest people tackle the most challenging problems because they feel safe. They feel enjoyment out of tackling those problems. Um, and when people are happy, they produce more, better, and faster. And Sean Ecker talks about this in The Happiness Advantage. I don't know, anybody read his book? Um, and I think we can all agree, when people go home satisfied at the end of the day, they can take a load off, they can relax, they can hang with their families, they can come back the next day to produce more things better and faster. Uh, so this is from the 2016 State of DevOps report, which a few other talks have referenced. This is uh, something that my company and other people put together. It's uh, 4,600 technical professionals that we survey. And this is what happens when teams are happy. You get 22% less time spent on unplanned work, 2.2 times more likely to recommend the organization to a friend, so you get like more better employees coming in all the time. Uh, way less change failure rate, and when you do have failure rates from changes, the recovery time can be 24 times faster. These are hard numbers from the past year, from 2016, uh, from technical professionals across the industry. Oh, I skipped one, sorry. So wh where do these tenets apply? Do they really apply across engineering disciplines? Do they, do they apply to QA? Um, I was in semiconductor design for a long time, doing simulation software and QA for simulation software. In semiconductor design, you have these super long feedback loops. You're designing this thing with this huge team, thousands of engineers, to produce one chip. Um, and it might be a year or more before you actually see the product. So how do you foster an environment where, uh, with those long feedback times, you, you have that mastery, that sense of mastery where you're leveling up all the time, you're, you're, you know your, your advancement all the time. Um, and things like simulation software goes a long way for that. So not only does it help like, produce less defects in the end chip and all that kind of good stuff, but um, you can sense your mastery all the time. You're like learning the simulation software. 
you can sense your progress. Um, and sometimes the purpose is just trying to create the best circuit possible to uh, solve the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, just like in other industries, puzzles are like a huge thing for a lot of people. And then purpose for some semiconductor design. Some people love being able to tell their families and their friends, like, oh, I have circuitry in that computer over there. Or like, I wrote my name secretly in the traces on the, the board on that, on that computer. Um, does it apply in interior design? There, there's kind of ways that you can apply this to anything, right? So autonomy is finding your own solutions. You know, where am I going to, can I fit this piece of furniture in here? Um, mastery is same thing, like simulation software. And purpose could be better living, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my living room look great. I'm going to have people over here. They're going to think that I'm awesome because my living room looks so cool. Um, there's a kind of a story around this. And, and the reason I, I have this in here is that we were actually doing some layout in my house, my partner and I. And we're actually, we're very outdoorsy people. It's one of the reasons we live here in Portland. Um, and we were going to go camping. And we found ourselves using Google SketchUp, or what used to be Google SketchUp, anybody use that 3D modeling, um, to lay out our living room on like a Saturday when we could have been outside, beautiful day. But we found ourselves just doing this thing because um, it was kind of fun, new software. Uh, we were trying to get somewhere with our living room. That was the purpose. Um, so we found ourselves doing this even though we're supposedly outdoorsy people. And most importantly, QA. I think people have seen that GIF before. But of course it applies to QA. I mean, I've been talking about this whole time. And I think most people here understand how fun QA can be. I think a lot of people get into testing because uh, it's very diverse in the work that you're doing. You're not just like focused on one tiny thing inside of this other tiny thing, inside of this huge thing. Uh, you actually get to work on all these different things, challenging yourself to find bugs and possibly solutions all the time, and finding your own way to create those bugs right, that nobody else could find. And that's where the mastery comes in, but also lots of languages, environments, um, styles of software that produce different things, styles of hardware they might be testing it on. Um, it's one big puzzle. So purpose and QA uh, can be difficult for some people, but most people just focus on the users. right? We're, we're trying to deliver quality stuff to users, pretty clear. Um, in some cases, uh, we're lucky enough to do software for things that are going to save people's lives. Um, if you're really lucky, you have ownership stake in your company. That can be the purpose. Um, and then team is the same thing, right? Like you're trying to help the devs. You're trying to get a feedback, feedback to the devs as quickly as possible after they produce something. Um, and that can be like hopefully your team. Hopefully you're embedded um, with your developers so you can get feedback to them really quickly and you talk to them on a daily basis. It's one big team. So what about retention? People often say, like, we're, if we create this amazing environment for people, if we, if we make them better, aren't they just going to leave? There's a famous cliche where a CFO says, like, what if we train our employees and they leave? And CEO, of course, says, what if we don't and they stay? It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> Richard Branson says the same thing. He says, train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. It's kind of like, um, be so good they can't ignore you. I forget who said that. Um, but as individual contributors, we can feel like layoffs are imminent, even especially at big companies, even after you've been around for you know maybe a decade or more. So um, how do you continue doing your job when you feel like the end is, is nigh? Um, I think these three tenets go a long way. Um, you might love your work and hate the company, and that might be good enough for your purpose. It might be good enough to feel like you can level up inside the company or just in your group. Um, so what, really, what should we do? Oh, yes, Cal, no Cal Newport said, be so good they can't ignore you. Um, and, and this is the same thing. Um, if you're not properly motivated, if you're an individual contributor and you're not happy, if you're lucky and you can, find another job. I mean, it's, it's that simple, but it's not simple to do. Um, so 
while you're there, make it the best place that you can be. Um, figure out ways to find these three tenets in the work that you do every day. And also encouraging your team. Um, if you make a dent with your purpose um, and your team sees you doing this, it's going to be contagious. Happiness is contagious. Um, the other good way that people talk about, uh, there's a Gallup poll recently that talks about having best friends at work um, and how important that can be. 43% um, are more have reported more likely um, to have received praise, and 37% say they're more likely to report that someone has encouraged them when they say they have a best friend at work. Um, and that happiness can be the purpose, like I was talking about. But if you're a manager, the best thing you can do is really foster this environment, even if it doesn't come from uh, executive leadership. Um, so don't just talk about it. You need to foster an environment and track people's progress on these three things. Not Maybe not specifically, but if you can track them, um, then people feel like it's not just lip service. You're not just giving it to them to do. Um, they can kind of take mastery over their progress on these three tenets, on their career development, um, on their professional development. So as a reminder, this is what it's, what's at stake. Um, and you really don't have to believe me. I, mean, I think a lot of people here know that uh, agile development is all about trying things. So just try it out. Uh, iterate, see what works. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for everybody listening. Thanks to everybody at Puppet. We're, uh, we're hiring right now in QA. Um, and I'd like to thank my management company. They're very, uh, they're very good at fostering this type of environment, so it's a great place to work. Uh, again, I'm Eric Thompson. Um, and I'm not on this. <laughs> my name's not on this slide, but it was. But that's all I have. Any any questions, comments? All right. Well, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, tweet me. I'll put my first slide up. Um, that's my Twitter down there at the bottom. Um, and you can find me. That's a zero, by the way, not an O. So it sounds like the question is um, a lot of times we get past what we're going to do by the product owners. We don't have a lot of say in that with regards to autonomy. Um, so the autonomy comes solely at how we're going to do it. Um, uh, that's very true. I, I think from day to day, what I've seen is that sometimes that's OK. That's good enough. But I think that there's ways of making it better. Um, people talk about. Um, forming team goals as a team so that everybody knows their voices are being heard. Um, and that way, people all agree on the goals and they understand their connection to those goals and uh, can find their own way to those goals. Even if the direction from product, for instance, is a little bit different than what they would do, um, I think everybody understands that product is in the best position Hopefully, people understand that product is in the best position to understand how to get to those goals. And we have our f small part in, in getting us there. And hopefully, that's good enough. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or one way to answer your question? Yeah. That's a, good, that's a challenge and a, and a really good question. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, if you don't, so I think the this follow on was um, if product disagrees and we don't feel like we're being heard, it can eat away at us as individuals, um, and I, that's a that's a big challenge as well. I think we have to make sure that as leaders that we're ensuring that our people are being heard in various different ways. Uh, that especially comes into play with um, internal processors or what some people some people call internal processors. 
or um, um, people that don't want to speak up in public. Um, so allowing them a venue to speak up can be really important so that they understand that their voice is being heard, um, even if it's not uh, in, like, in a group meeting or something like that. So fostering an environment where people feel like their voice is being heard uh, it is important, which I think you were implying. Uh, I think I have a question in the back. Forming a cohesive team between possibly the uh, engineers and product, if, if there's a separation there, so that they know that their voices are being heard. Yeah, good point. Did you have a question up here? So forming a lot, a lot better teams and, and more opportunity for uh, feedback cycles across functional boundaries um, so that people feel like they're being autonomous. Um, but you're saying that it doesn't sound like it might be enough in some cases? Absolutely. Good point, supporting evidence. But we're in the weeds a little bit uh, before we go too far. Anybody have any other questions? All right. We can talk more about that team building offline if anybody wants to. That's really interesting stuff. Thank you.